Plague, influenza, Ebola, the most contagious and deadly diseases in the world could be on our doorstep overnight. Would we recognize the symptoms? Can we treat the disease or even keep it from spreading? The margin of error? Stop. Zero. At stake for the medical team, their own lives, the safety of their families, and the community where they live. An elite group at a Nebraska hospital faced the real thing. This was not a drill. The lessons learned treating three different patients with Ebola reshaped high-risk emergency medicine nationwide. The crisis passed, but a question remains. Are we ready for what comes after Ebola? Nature is experimenting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So it's a little bit of a, a Frankenstein type picture that nature runs continuously. And we're never sure what the new bug is gonna be. We have to be prepared for that. Do an internet search for recent news coverage of pandemic or infectious disease and you will find recent stories about a high-risk outbreak somewhere in the world. Science can identify a virus quickly, but the world remains vulnerable. Avian flu, smallpox, cholera, new strains of tuberculosis. I don't need to point to some hypothetical disease in the future. I'll point to Zika and say, we're not ready. Clearly, we're not ready. So before the patient gets here, we need to have... There's a lot of work that needs to happen in hospitals and in public health departments to make sure we are ready for the next pandemic. Then came Ebola. A unique set of circumstances gave the University of Nebraska Medical Center the extraordinary opportunity to encounter face-to-face -face patients infected with one of the world's most frightening and highly infectious diseases. This became, in a sense, a dress rehearsal for the worst case scenario. What do you think we'll get? What would be the first one we'll get if we get one? Or which one would you rather get? And somebody piped up and said, I really hope we don't get Ebola because that's the worst of the worst. When you're docking, the only thing that you take off your stuff are your gloves and your respiratory protection. A special unit on the campus of the University of Nebraska Medical Center spent 10 years preparing for patients with dangerous, highly contagious diseases. This is the deadliest outbreak of Ebola on record. Ebola infections will double every three weeks. In a city of a million, almost 50 new cases are reported every day. In 2014, the Ebola virus swept through West Africa. More than 11,000 people died in Guinea. Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Nigeria. The crisis meeting to discuss the Ebola outbreak. This Ebola thing is not under control. We are not being told the truth. Most of those who get it will die through uncontrollable... Without a doubt, people are afraid. If you look at Ebola, there's no treatment. There's no vaccine for the most part. That's a scary situation. By late summer, the United States government felt Americans infected with the hemorrhagic fever should be brought to this country for medical care. Emory University in Atlanta received the first Ebola patients ever treated in the U.S. At the time, only three hospitals in America had facilities able to safely contain and treat the disease. Emory, the National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C., and the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We are following breaking news of national import in Omaha at this hour. We are live at the Nebraska Medical Center. Doctors are holding a news conference to discuss an American doctor with the Ebola virus coming to the Nebraska Medical Center. Well, I'll never forget I was walking down the hallway with Angela Hewlett, the associate medical director, and my phone goes off. It said State Department. I thought, now, here we go. And they said, we like your unit. In fact, we like it so much that we're going to send an Ebola patient to you. And we started saying, well, what do we need to do now? And it involved a very quick array of phone calls and talking with the health department and the rest of the biocontainment unit leadership team. The Nebraska Isolation Unit was a creation of the University of Nebraska. The privately managed hospital, Nebraska Medicine, 
and the state's Department of Health and Human Services. We say that for activation, it's kind of like a safety deposit box. You need two keys, the state health department and the hospital. State health officials agreed it was time to open the unit to accept its first patient. It was a little bit surreal, but more than a little intimidating, I think. And it was definitely um, invigorating in the sense that I think our team said, OK, we're activating, we're going to do this work, we're going to work through this problem, and that's exactly what happened. And we needed to do so in a way where the healthcare providers themselves weren't jeopardized. And that was the real advantage that the University of Nebraska Medical Center provided. Patient one, Dr. Richard Sacra, a medical missionary based in Liberia. He apparently contracted Ebola delivering a baby. With the Ebola virus engulfing his body, the U.S. government arranged the airlift to Omaha, Nebraska. We didn't know exactly when they would come, but I remember getting another call late in the evening from the State Department saying, wheels up in Monrovia. That meant the patient's in the air and there's no turning back. There was definitely a physical reaction. Yeah, there was a little bit of, a little bit of fast heartbeat, a little bit of all of that going on. I tingled from head to foot. It's almost something that's hard to believe. We were ready for it, but when it actually happened, you said, wow, this is an amazing event, historic event. The biocontainment team included two dozen doctors, 10 lab workers, six respiratory therapists, five patient care technicians, and 22 nurses. I got the text, and we actually have a, a system that sends you a text message that says, NBU activation, this is not a drill. <laughs> and so I read it, and I read it again. I was almost relieved the first time I was going in, because, mm -hmm. you know, you think about it, you think about it, you practice it, mm -hmm. you know what, and so I'm almost like, okay, thank God, we're just gonna do this now, you know? <laughs> we just were like, let's go. So we brought our team in again and said, he's coming, probably be here in 48 hours. I wanted today to have maybe 20 minutes or so and answer any questions. I wanted to make sure we had every detail taken care of and they felt confident and safe. I remember saying that we'd trained for 10 years for this moment. And these were our fellow Americans. And if we aren't going to seize this, then really everything we've done has been for naught. When the plane actually touched down, I was in the biocontainment unit already uh, with my team. We were all in the unit, and we, we were watching it on television. At that time, the, the nurses were ready. We knew who, which people were going to be in the first shift. The physicians were all there. And then we knew we had about 30 minutes to get things ready. And breaking news now at 619 on First News. An American doctor with Ebola is in Omaha. This is a live look from the Nebraska Medical Center where Dr. Rick Sacre will be treated. He landed at Bellevue's off at Air Force Base in the past half hour. Plans for getting the patient across town and safely inside the hospital fell to John Lowe, the unit's infection control specialist. It was an incredibly unique experience. So it happened very early in the morning. It was still dark out and it had been raining all night. There were no cameras on the ground to record the transfer from jet to ambulance. The plane arrived shortly after we did at Offutt Air Force Base. It parked out on the tarmac, and we had a military security vehicle escort the Omaha Fire Ambulance. My role and responsibility is that if anything is done differently than how it was anticipated, we're going to stop it. So I was watching incredibly intently all of the different movements of our personnel and the patient to make sure everything was going as planned and looking for anything that I felt like we would need to stop and address before we went further. I was standing at the bottom of the stairs looking up and the patient, you know, came to the door of the aircraft and I just remember thinking, why am I here? <laughs> you know, I did not have to be the one doing this. As the patient came down the stairs and we got him onto the gurney, that's what he became. He became my patient. I'm a nurse, I'm going to take care of him, and, and that's what it, it was. The city of Omaha emergency medical technicians knew the danger. The slightest contact with body fluids could be a fatal proposition. For months, they drilled anticipating the transport of high-risk patients from one hospital to another. 
Dr. Sacra's arrival from West Africa provided an unexpected twist, delivery by jet. In a matter of days, the fire department drew up plans to get the patient safely off the plane. Having a patient flown into the Air Force Base was a little bit different than what we had anticipated from a hospital-hospital transfer within the Omaha Metro. The motorcade was overseen by Nebraska State Patrol. This was essentially the same motorcade and same protocol that they used when the president came to Omaha to help move the president through the community quickly. So as we take a live look right now at uh, the transportation it looks like from Bellevue, as you can see. If you're familiar with the highway that runs from Bellevue into Omaha, at about eight o'clock in the morning, it can get pretty congested. Quickest trip from Offutt Air Force Base to the medical center I've ever had. Inside the ambulance, Dr. Sacra remained in his protective suit on the gurney, delirious from the drugs used to calm him during the flight. I did see his eyes. I could see that, you know, he was very thankful to be here. We had a conversation where, you know, I welcomed him to Nebraska and told him that we were going to take, you know, the best care that we could of him. We can see a line of vehicles coming down the street now escorted. There were a number of us sort of on a conference call that morning, watching it unwind on TV. And I think we were basically saying to ourselves, please let this go how it was planned to go. We think they've done everything right, but it's trust, but be careful and monitor. And that was our role in public health, to make sure that those healthcare workers who go back home every night aren't at risk to the broader community. We didn't see a great deal of press from our motorcade until we got down here to 42nd and Emily, where there was a whole line of cameras and press recording that transport. So that's when it really started to sink in that all eyes were on this process. Everyone was kind of quiet and doing their job. And the patient rolled in and went to the, the designated room, and then the work began. Why here? Why this hospital in Omaha, Nebraska? It was the largest biocontainment unit in America. How did it get here? After the September 11 attacks brought fears of bioterrorism, America needed hospitals able to cope with an outbreak of smallpox or who knows what. Dr. Smith believed if UNMC got federal and state funds for bioterrorism, the unit's mission could expand to care for patients with a variety of highly contagious diseases. They can see the fan, just the kind of air that blows inside the... Well, they're all diseases with a very high mortality rate, 50% to 90%. They're diseases generally like Ebola, for which there's no vaccine and there is no treatment, so they're incurable. And thirdly, they're contagious. Those three factors are the things in general that puts the diseases on the most wanted list. A biocontainment unit has things that are a little bit different than a regular hospital room. Things like engineering controls, special airflow and things like that to try to keep infectious diseases inside of the care facility as opposed to letting them into the outside world. We want the air to be sucked in, pull the germs in and not let them get out and into the community. It senses that there's a leak. No one could predict what disease might present itself. Some spread by way of bodily fluids. Others transmit by air. There's no telling what equipment might be needed in any of the five rooms. It's bare bones by design. What makes it different when we have a patient and we go in is that everybody knows their roles. So all of that happens in one fell swoop. The high-risk nature of the work demanded special skills than a staff with a particular frame of mind. Biocontainment units also have specialized staff, so they have trained teams of nurses and physicians who do a lot of drills and training in order to take care of patients with highly infectious diseases. We're all volunteer staff, which is different than regular hospital, although you obviously volunteer for your job if you're applying for a job. But in our situation, just because you work here at UNMC doesn't necessarily mean that you will be part of our biocontainment unit team. You have to actually want to be part of the team. By the end of that nine years, we had the hardcore biocontainment geeks, if you want to say it that way. And uh, that's what helped us be ready. The rooms, the staff, the planning, 
that was all in place. Year after year, the only thing lacking were the patients. Because I know there were times when the hospital was full, we had to divert people to other hospitals. They were saying, why are we just letting his 10 bed units sit there? Dr. Smith put his foot down about 100 times, saying, we need to keep this unit. We are going to need it. Trust me. To their credit, they had the long vision, and they could see the global trends and the fact that this is something that could be very useful if there were an outbreak down the line. Down the line was now. The federal government requested the Nebraska Medical Center activate the unit. I remember watching our first patient wheel into the unit, and I thought, I am now engaging in the treatment of someone who has a disease that is almost sure to kill him. Dr. Daniel Johnson spent most of his time in the UNMC intensive care unit. He didn't have the years of training in biocontainment procedures. In fact, he'd been recruited only days earlier when it was clear his skill set would benefit the treatment of Rick Sacra. I was getting put into a suit that I had only ever seen either on the news or in movies. In the moments leading up to going into the room, I did have a little wave of fear and anxiety. I helped him get his gear on. Um, we had a little talk right before he walked into the biocontainment unit. I just said, go in there and do what you do every day, and just be extra careful. For this patient, inserting a standard IV was impossible. Sacra arrived so dehydrated, the medical team feared his veins would collapse. This is actually a, a large catheter that goes into the neck, into one of the veins in the neck. And the reason we have to do that is because we wanted to be able to deliver those medications quickly and effectively. This would be Dr. Sacra's lifeline. For Dr. Johnson, a routine procedure became perilous. Damaging the juggler vein had deadly consequences for everyone. It was the walk down the hallway that was actually more nerve wracking than anything else. The fight or flight response is off the charts. As soon as I walked in the room and saw a human being there who needed my help, I was fine. When someone was drawing blood, we were all looking at it on, our, on our video system. Everybody would just stop and you know, keep their fingers crossed. Holding my breath, wringing my hands and my gloves, doing every, everything like that. But I'll tell you, it went, it went off very well. Uh, one of the nurses and I both had inches of sweat that are, it was up above our ankle within our suit when we walked out of the room after the first procedure. There's actually a photograph of me after, right after I've taken my suit off and I am drenched and I've just got two thumbs up with a huge smile on my face. It was a nice moment. Dr. Smith and Shelley told us that everything was gonna be good. We had prepared for this. We knew what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And they said this kind of calm that it kind of was like, well, okay, they say it's all gonna be okay. It'll, mm -hmm. be, it'll be good. We know what we're doing. We're smart. We've yeah. practiced. Let's we, go. We bought into it. Right. Yeah. We bought into it. <laughs> Staying safe begins with the layout of the unit itself. With five specialized rooms, up to 10 patients can be treated at once. Caring for this single case of Ebola meant rooms were available to keep medical supplies close at hand and provide space for biohazard waste waiting to be sterilized. An on-site lab was added later. The unit's kind of like an L shape. You've got your nurse's station and then it, it goes up a long corridor. We have a line, and that line marked the difference between clean and warm. The hot zones, of course, were the patient rooms. When we say the hot zone is the patient room, that's where the highest burden of viral load is most likely to be present. The warm zone is where you're gonna take off your equipment, and then the cold zone is where you would say there's the least likely chance that you're going to be exposed to the virus. There are behaviors that are restricted to every zone, and that's to help decrease the risk of cross-contamination. The safe operation of the biocontainment unit relies on a set of protocols, standard operating procedures guiding every doctor, nurse, and technician. Tuck inner cape into suit. Nurses rotate on four-hour shifts, always with a backup. When our people went into the room and we always wanted a second person in personal protective equipment, that if the caregivers in the room needed something, that person could quickly step in and be ready to go.
So PPE stands for Personal Protective Equipment. And that's everything from, from gloves, masks, respirators, gowns, hoods, visors, all of those things. And what that's going to do is put a barrier between you and the infection. When we opened and we were looking at what policies were there for, for one thing, putting on and taking off PPE, there wasn't any. And we had to develop that right from the beginning. In Africa, healthcare workers responding to the Ebola crisis died at alarming rates, in part because doctors and nurses removed gloves and gowns in ways that put them in contact with the very virus killing their patients. We decided we needed to develop strict policies, protocols, on how to put on the PPE safely, meaning you were going to be completely covered. And then more importantly, you were going to get it off in a way that you didn't contaminate yourself. You want to make sure that you have everything covered that could transmit any kind of Ebola virus to you. Any mucous membranes, eyes, nose, mouth, lungs, because we breathe in. Donning is the word for putting on the gear. Taking off the gear is known as doffing. So you can kind of turn and make it easier for you, like do one shoulder, turn back, do another shoulder, turn back. There's a very significant sequence to taking it off so that you make sure you go from most contaminated to least contaminated. You come out of a room and you've just been seeing a patient with Ebola, the last thing you want to think about is, did I remember to put that step in the right order? And so we take that element out and we have a person who's been outside the room who actually directs every move you make. That's the most vulnerable point in the entire care continuum. In simulations, newcomers to the team learn the sequences designed to keep them safe. Disposable boots come off first to avoid tracking. Feet shift to different zones on a mat to avoid recontamination. Helpers carefully peel away hoods to avoid spatter. The three pairs of gloves come off in a specific sequence. Yep, and that will happen. That will happen in real life, too. So what you want to do, take a minute, pause, reset, troubleshoot through it. We taught people stop, assess the risk, get help, take your time. Nothing is worth putting yourself at increased jeopardy for. Comfort with the safety rituals allowed the medical team to focus on Dr. Saker's recovery. Well, he was ill, and we knew he was very ill from the fact that he was somewhat delirious, although his vital signs were stable. And after the physical exam, it was obvious he was not at death's door, but he was quite sick. And then we drew laboratory work, and his laboratory work was way out of whack. Out of whack, in this case, meant Dr. Sacra's inadequate electrolyte levels caused the convulsions, nausea, and diarrhea racking his body. Dr. Smith explained to reporters, even if a cure was elusive, routine medicine could cope with the symptoms. There is a feeling amongst the clinicians to treat these patients that if you can get fluids in them early and, and uh, balance their electrolytes, you can prevent some of the complications. But even that's just a supposition, but it, it makes a lot of sense. Smith consulted with doctors around the world and found reason to be encouraged. Reducing the fever and dehydration allowed a body to heal and fight the virus. Ebola need not be a death sentence. This is just manageable flu-like symptoms. We can, we can do this. And so within the first 12-hour shift or 14-hour shift, we had, we had overcome a lot of challenges, I think, that we addressed right away and mm -hmm. moved on. It was new territory everywhere, really, because, you know, we had learned lessons, so we were looking at what could we learn from past events. Two American medical missionaries stricken with Ebola had been airlifted out of Africa to Emory University. The hospital had its own isolation ward where highly infectious diseases could be safely treated. Both were cured. Today is a miraculous day. I'm thrilled to be alive, to be well. One survivor, Dr. Kent Brantley, was a friend of Sacra's. He donated 800 cc's of his own plasma because research showed antibodies in the blood of people recovering from some diseases can help fight off viruses. The convalescent plasma, uh, in other words, taking blood from a patient who's recovered and has antibodies, is a very safe treatment modality. So we felt very confident giving it to Dr. Sacra. 
Approval for testing experimental drugs on humans can take years. For Ebola, the medical team in Nebraska got fast-track emergency clearance from the government. Ultimately, it wasn't clear if any of the drugs helped contain the virus inside Dr. Sacra. We now know that without sophisticated drugs, we can take down the number of people who die from 8 in 10 to maybe 4 in 10 or something like that, just with good management of the fluids you give them, the minerals you put back into their body. So that's been a great message. In biocontainment, the patient's room becomes a tiny self-enclosed world. Visitors, including Rick Saker's wife, Debbie, could only visit by way of a video feed at the nurse's station. The staff found ways to make small talk through plastic shields. You know, initially I think it's hard because I attribute a lot of my interaction with patients with touch, and, and you don't have that human touch in this case. But I don't know if it was because of the situation that we were in. You got very close to these patients. We are their human interaction, and so we spent a lot of time doing, you know, therapeutic communication. I think when he was eating normally, and when he started to be bored <laughs> of being in the biocontainment unit, there was a sense of relief. Because so much was unknown about this disease, when we started to see even those little increments of improvement, we got very excited. The Centers for Disease Control required two separate blood tests verifying virus loads low enough to ensure no one else would contract the fever. We were waiting on the lab work, and when we got word that the viral loads were negative, when that happened, there was a lot of a lot of joy, a lot of excitement. I'm smiling just thinking about it, just thinking about back to that day, because he was waiting. You know, Dr. Saker, he's a he's a physician. He he knew what was going on with him. He was feeling better, and he was ready. He was ready to get out of there. He was ready to see his family. Twenty-five days after tests confirmed he had the disease, Rick and Debbie Sacra were reunited. God has used you to restore my life to me. I am so grateful. I would like to request a continued outpouring of prayer and practical help for the people of West Africa. Though my crisis has reached a successful end here, unfortunately, the Ebola crisis continues to spin out of control. The lessons learned inside the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit would be tested again. A disease anywhere can be a disease everywhere. As international air travel becomes common, emergency room crews anywhere in America could encounter exotic, highly infectious diseases. Before 2014, a lot of facilities just didn't have these things in place. They just weren't, weren't ready to take care of these kind of patients. Uh, I was getting a lot of emails from people out in the world, in the community, across the nation, asking, you know, what's your protocol for this? How do we do this? How many times were you asked, is it safe for the rest of us? Too many to count. How confident do you feel? Um, I feel very confident in our unit and in our team and our staff. I think there was tremendous fear that somebody was going to show up in their place and they really didn't have the understanding or knowledge to know what to do. Well-founded fears, as it turned out. The first person to have been diagnosed with Ebola in the United States has died in a Texas hospital. Thomas Eric Duncan, a Liberian visiting Dallas, was sent home from a hospital emergency room after complaining of a high fever. His travel history should have been a red flag. Duncan carried the deadly virus from his home in Liberia, but did not show any symptoms when he arrived in the U.S. on September 20th. He returned to the same hospital presenting all the symptoms of Ebola and died within days. There was already a high level of anxiety among many Americans, and the death in Texas only fans the Ebola fears. Two nurses on his treatment team contracted the virus. Both survived. A lot changed as well after what happened in Texas when the nurses got sick. Then there was a lot more interest. The U.S. health workers aren't satisfied. 
They say the government needs to do more. We've been told a lot of things that have been wrong. We've been lied to. I remember when that poor Dallas nurse mm -hmm. came down with Ebola. You know, that brought up a lot of interesting feelings. But this poor woman didn't have the resources that we did. Just as the unsettling news broke in Dallas, the U.S. State Department requested the Nebraska Medical Center prepare for a second American infected with Ebola. Barely two weeks had passed since Dr. Saker's release. Our patient arrived in his room a few hours ago, directly from West Africa, and is now- Photographer Ashoka Mukpo fell ill in Liberia while on assignment covering the Ebola outbreak for NBC News. He's enormously relieved to be here. Of course, it's still quite frightening. The biocontainment unit assumed all along there would be more Ebola cases. In the days before admitting this new patient, they continued to review procedures and refine the protocols, from changes in protective gear to how to unclog a toilet that becomes a biohazard. This is really typical of this team. I can't tell you how many times we've really made small adjustments in our how to get a specimen safely out of the room into the lab. A small change was a big deal when it came to getting lab results faster. When drawn from an Ebola patient, blood instantly becomes a high-level biohazard. The state of Nebraska maintains a high-security testing laboratory on the campus of the medical center. It took at least 40 minutes between drawing the lab and getting it there to begin the analysis. We changed that process very quickly. By the time the second patient arrived, the med center had arranged for the biocontainment unit to set up a temporary lab in an unused patient room. Look at the news that came out with the nurses in Dallas. I mean, we really had no room for air, and that was the caution that we were taking. Lab director Pete Iwan found little precedent or guidance from the Centers for Disease Control for safe handling of the samples. They, quite frankly, didn't have it all in writing either. So it's kind of like, OK, I would call an emergency operations center and say, I need guidance on how to do this particular sample or how to run this sample, process you know, it in the laboratory safely. And quite frankly, what I got at response was, we'll get back to you. They didn't have the information. So we were involved in the process of writing protocols on how to do this. On the fly. On the fly. In the movies, heroes treating a pandemic wear sturdy, high-tech biohazard suits sterilized in chemical showers. The truth? In this unit, most personal protective gear gets thrown away. The garbage infected with Ebola accumulated quickly, day after day, a thousand pounds per patient. In general, it was probably four or five times the normal daily waste coming out of an ICU room. Hospitals routinely use an autoclave, a method of high-pressure steam cleaning to sterilize equipment. Here, it also decontaminates the dangerous garbage left behind. Efficiencies learned after treating the first patient allowed the team to reduce the amount of waste by hundreds of pounds. Safe handling remained a constant. It was clean, stored in the hot zone, several steps there. Then it would be wiped again and brought up to the warm zone where somebody in the full PPE that's running the autoclave could then get it and cleanly get it to the autoclave and then run through the steps of the autoclave. Mundane routines become life and death matters in the unit. The medical team stayed healthy as a second Ebola patient left their care to celebrate his recovery. When I first came in, you know, Dr. Smith, I said, I looked up at him and I said, am I going to make it? And he goes, we don't know a whole lot about this. <laughs> Once again, the treatment cycle worked. Hydration and appropriate medication. Blood tests from Ashoka Mukpo confirmed he was Ebola-free in just 20 days, five days sooner than Rick Sacra. We feel we learned some things about the natural course of the disease and and, and how to intervene, and we're applying what we've learned to the new patient. Even as a cure seemed elusive, the lessons learned from the treatment of patients in Nebraska and at Emory University seemed to improve the overall health of the patients, making it possible 
to survive Ebola. The care in Africa was influenced by the care here because we learned very quickly how much fluids we should be giving, what type of fluids we should be giving, what sort of electrolytes we should be monitoring. So that was easily transferable. Successful models used to care for the American patients proved to be of little value in the treatment of Dr. Martin Salia. I firmly believe God wanted me to do it. It was a calling. Dr. Salia served in missionary hospitals throughout his career as a surgeon. In 2014, he was chief medical officer at the Kissy United Methodist Hospital in his native Sierra Leone. As the Ebola epidemic worsened, the life-saving surgeries he routinely performed became dangerous, even heroic. I see it as God's own desired framework for me. I just need to lean on him, trust him for whatever comes in, because he sent me here, and that's my passion. A few weeks after that interview, Dr. Salia contracted Ebola. A delayed diagnosis gave the virus a 13-day head start. We're told transporting him took longer because of how critically ill Dr. Martin Salia is. He was physically unable to walk off the plane, and we don't even As know soon as you hear that someone's not going to walk off a plane, when the other patients you received have walked off a plane, you understand the, the situation is different. Every aspect of the patient's care would be more challenging. Every procedure would be more risky for the medical team. I was his main ICU physician. So I admitted him with Dr. Hewlett and Dr. Smith. And I spent, at one point, 30 some hours in a row in the unit uh, with the nursing staff and the other team members trying to turn him for the better. He was very sick, uh, not only in person, but also on paper in his lab work. And we knew that it was going to be a real, real uphill battle. We applied every possible therapy to every problem that he had, uh, just the way we do in the regular intensive care unit. Nothing was held back because he was in the biocontainment unit. It was too late. And, and we, we battled. Uh, and, and by battle, I mean it was a, a real battle. And I've seen a lot of patients in the ICU. I do that routinely and part, as part of my, my job. But, um, but he, was, he was incredibly sick. And those last few hours, we knew that we weren't winning. And it was clear that after some period of time, his body was just, it had shut down. His body couldn't go on anymore. The disease had overwhelmed him. And um, it was an absolutely awful feeling when I realized that we needed to stop, that he had died. And anything more that we did to him was not ethical or humane. And I, I remember looking at him and just taking his hand. It was particularly difficult because he was an amazing person. The next step, though, was to tell my team, everybody in the room, everybody listen, don't do anything that's going to compromise your own health and safety. We are going to follow those protocols perfectly so that no one in this room ends up with this disease. We watched how terrible this disease is. We saw it in person. And, and I think that Dr. Johnson did an excellent job of just taking a step back and saying, all this is happening. And we all, you know, we all want to grieve, we all want to, but we need to also remember that we need to be careful. That's, that's one of everybody's goal as a healthcare mm -hmm. worker when someone dies, to give them that grace and dignity. And patients that die from Ebola are very infectious. That's part of the reason that this disease was rapidly transmitted in Africa was during that burial process. And after patients had, had died, people contaminating themselves and getting sick from that process. The process disposing of human remains put a crucial safety procedure to the test for the first time at the medical center. It became a unique mixture of ritual and caution. Yes, we did have to follow CDC guidance and our own protocol to package the remains, 
but we had the support of our institution to go above and beyond that, to take the time. We wrap our patient in their bedding first, and then when we go to put them into the mortuary bags, we even put the pillow behind their head. At every stage, the medical team swabs surfaces with bleach. The deceased is placed between sheets of special watertight material to contain any biohazard. Every edge is heat sealed twice. A separate crew in protective gear helps transfer the body through the doorway into the warm zone and a third containment bag before being prepared for cremation. And then to be able to provide those ashes back to the family, I think that that was a really a relief for the family. And I think that for us, that's where it was such an intense experience because we knew the type of person that we were treating. And I think that we really felt it very intensely because we were not able to help this particular person survive the disease. We didn't think Ebola was gonna be in the state of Nebraska. It brought it home real hard. You always think someone else will handle that. The big lesson for emergency crews in hospitals across Nebraska and across the country, planning and practice can improve the odds of keeping safe the medical teams and the people out in the community. Midwest Medical to St. Elizabeth. We are transporting an Ebola patient. What's your ETA, Midwest Medical? 10 minutes. Midwest encoded that they were 10 minutes away with an Ebola patient, okay. but no other details. Okay. He's got diarrhea. Could have fluid in his lungs. Okay. So let's get our areas marked appropriately so we have our cold zone marked off. That way. Attention all house staff. This is an infectious disease exercise. Command center has been activated. It's taken the worst case scenario and learning off of that, and it's almost like if you can deal with that, you're gonna be fine with many of these other ones. For years, medical centers used realistic drills to test their ability to cope with a mass casualty tornado or a school bus crash. Since Ebola, many hospitals stage test runs for staff who might encounter a highly infectious disease. Surprise complications expose flaws in training or equipment. Honest input from staff helps improve the system. We know Ebola may not hit, but there may be another infectious disease or something that the practice and the information that we learn from that will be able to apply. And the things that we had done, it doesn't make any sense for us to do this in a silo and to just work it out on our own and not tell anybody else because other centers may encounter these types of patients. The care and coordination of highly infectious disease patients and related procedural training. And my name is Phil Smith. I'm medical director of the biocontainment unit and welcome you to our program today. In the months following the treatment of the Ebola patients in the U.S., there was a tremendous demand for information. Healthcare professionals hope to benefit from the lessons learned during these rare high-risk cases. So other facilities have to be ready to take care of these patients, and we were very willing to share our learnings, our learnings clinically, our learnings operationally, with everyone who was willing to listen. Truly one of the barriers identified was, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years, it's never happened to me. Sometimes the most basic lessons became the most essential. So it doesn't have to be all the bells and whistles that we had, but you need to know how to wear proper personal protective equipment. I think I would just say basic PPE and solid screening, two things that could help us the most. I'm not feeling very well. That second piece, screening, being alert for what might be coming through the emergency room door. My chest really hurts and I have a bad cough. In most cases, the biocontainment unit would get some warning before a case arrives. Any other hospital never knows for sure. The consequences of misdiagnosing that one case of Ebola at the hospital in Dallas became a cautionary tale heard around the world. Prior to all this, if someone had presented with some of those symptoms where we check into our emergency room, they'd gone back to the emergency room. and then if you know we truly had something like this, we could have shut down the emergency room. 
and that would create quite a problem. So we've learned a lot. Before the Ebola crisis subsided, the Federal Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, updated guidelines for checking in patients at hospitals and clinics. Have you been outside of the United States in the last 21 days? No, I have not. No. The CDC gives us some guidance about questions to ask, and often it has to do with, have you traveled outside of the United States? Um, have you received routine immunizations? Because it is hard to tell just by looking at somebody. That woman with a fever might have returned from Sierra Leone, where Ebola remains a threat, or contracted Zika from a mosquito bite during a church mission trip to Haiti, or picked up tuberculosis from a visiting relative. In a community like Lexington, where we have lots of people that are moving around, the temptation is to say, all right, we have a lot of immigrants. Naturally, we consider ourselves to be at higher risk. And while that may be true, it's also a more specific conversation with somebody about where have you traveled. Those are the kind of things that help us as much as looking at somebody's nationality. Just how bad could it get if it all goes wrong? And today, we have you all in one room. And we're finally to the point where we are going to exercise that pandemic really impacting your community. In Dawson County, a fictional epidemic drill organized by a regional public health cooperative revealed how quickly an influenza outbreak could undermine community institutions. Last one. Oh, this is our school nurse. They started the exercise by randomly picking names of crucial real-world characters lost to the flu, those too ill or already dead. The problem is this, when the healthcare workers start coming down with this and you take a disease like influenza where we're all commingling out there in the community, your healthcare worker may have a risk of picking the disease up in the course of their job. The clinic is flooded because we've lost at least two of the people at the front desk and one of our providers. Yes. So they're saying, I don't want to wait in line. It's like, listen, you will wait if you're healthier than the person in front of you. When your workforce at the facilities is decimated, then you're really straining your care provision resources. So it's a major problem. We would implement our protocols to try to keep people as safe as possible and separated from each other. What is happening outside the hospital starts to strain the very fabric of the community. Law enforcement being down, um, they've called in all available off-duty, retired, possible using security guards for local facilities. So it brings out questions that you need to be answered by your staff, your administration, you yourself. You know, what if I was sick? Who's going to fill my position and know as much as I need to know to fulfill that requirement and have the information they need to continue down the road. So this baby is dying if we don't take immediate action. Will you call LifeLight and see if they can still take her? Uh, we do think this is influenza related, um, so we need to um, proceed with caution with the family. By us doing exercises like this, making people aware that we are planning for the unexpected, will it ever happen? We don't know, but at least when it does happen, we have something to go off of rather than nothing. Uh, the funeral homes are already getting inundated mm -hmm. and refrigerated vehicles are being ordered to come in to house the dead. The uh, fictional outbreak in Dawson County mirrored a historic calamity from 100 years ago. Spanish influenza killed on a massive scale in Nebraska, across America, and across the world. From what we know from 1918, they talk about huge death rates, death among old people, death among pregnant people. I mean, imagine young, healthy, pregnant women suddenly dying of the flu. I think it'd be a really frightening event because it's not just people getting sick, it's people dying and young people dying, young, healthy people. Visit a cemetery of a certain age anywhere in America and graves of the dead from the winter of 1918 can easily be found. The death toll worldwide may have exceeded 50 million people. That was a respiratory spread. Anybody within three feet of uh, somebody who had it was at risk. That was probably, I would say, uh, worse than Ebola in terms of its virulence, the combination of its virulence and its ease of communicability. Public health experts consider a lethal strain of the flu the most likely scenario for a modern killer pandemic. A rogue strain of the flu could present itself anywhere in the world. 750,000 Americans 
died a century ago from influenza. Influenza could be really bad. I mean, it is our biggest concern about what a pandemic could look like. Modern medicine couldn't happen again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it makes me laugh. It's a big fallacy to think that modern medicine would protect us completely from the next influenza pandemic. Two years after Ebola came to Nebraska, the Omaha Fire Department received word from the biocontainment unit a new round of patients would be delivered by jet from Liberia. So what I want to do is I want to pull together the drivers and the medics. Patients arrived one at a time in 2014, delivered weeks apart. This time, three Americans contracted the disease within days of each other and needed to be airlifted out of Africa immediately. Patient number one is a 34-year-old male, 125 kilos. Fever, weakness, renal failure, liver failure, respiratory distress. Three separate ambulance crews will be dispatched to the airport. We don't do IVs, we don't do crazy stuff. All right, they're really doing CPR. With this disease, that person's dead. So no, no sense making things worse for us in, in an unsuccessful attempt. This is, however, a drill organized by the U.S. Department of State and the Medical Center. One size doesn't fit all, but if you're doing a really good job on rehearsing and planning and dealing with one event, it gives you the comfort level and the confidence that you can deal with different events that have different kinds of disease transmission scenarios. Perfect. Ambulances delivering highly infectious patients are wrapped in industrial weight plastic sheeting. We're trying to mitigate the risk of contamination of that ambulance and we're trying to make sure that any cleaning of that ambulance is good. So that if we put that ambulance back into service, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's clean. Before 2014, only a handful of first responders prepared plans for these unusual cases. The guidelines tested in the real world by UNMC and Emory University became the Bible for emergency medical responders. It's now fair to say a year later that we didn't infect any of our healthcare workers and we definitely did not infect our community. And not only do we not infect anybody, but we actually sort of blazed the trail on how can you take care of patients safely, but also take care of them. And this is brand new. Many of the lessons learned will soon be shared inside a new training center on the Med Center's campus. So we have two separate quarantine units. With $24 million in federal funds, the National Center for Health Security plans to use high-tech training methods to the benefit of American government researchers and medical teams struggling to contain a pandemic. In addition to the quarantine, we'll have an entire biocontainment unit that's simulated here with state-of-the-art training opportunities. Word came that the jet carrying the simulated Ebola patients would be arriving within minutes. For some of the paramedics, this marked their first experience donning personal protective gear under pressure. Guys, we have about 10 minutes before we need to leave. For EMTs, testing the procedures and learning the risks of highly infectious diseases can determine how comfortable they'd be volunteering for these hazardous assignments. I think that that helps us when we go out and ask someone to presumably put their own wellness at risk by entering this environment, that they're able to make that decision in an informed manner based on science. The three patients arrived from Liberia in a specially outfitted Boeing 747, chartered from a private medical transport service. The weather provided a real-life slap in the face that computer models and conference room discussions can never duplicate. Bitterly cold, 40-mile-an-hour winds ripped protective masks from the faces of the EMTs. The elevator platform shook and rattled as it delivered patients from the plane to ambulances below. Even in extreme circumstances, crews stuck to their protocols. That would allow us to test the full spectrum of protocols down to the minute detail, recognize things that we felt could be changed and done better, 
and we'd make those changes, and then the next year for that big full-scale exercise, we would test those. So we had a number of years of doing that. When the University of Nebraska Medical Center biocontainment unit opened, the team had no clue which killer virus would emerge. They can't possibly predict the next disease. And we didn't know. We didn't back off on our preparations, and I'm really glad we didn't. But I think that there's a good chance that during the next 10 years that there'll be a disease that'll be transferred up to the biocontainment unit. As the last patient was loaded into an ambulance, a team member in a biohazard suit walked down the airplane stairway, carefully wiping down the railing with disinfectant. Details mattered here. The details need to matter in hospitals big and small. Every city and county in America has a chance to prepare for whatever arrives after Ebola. The question is, are they ready? We have tons of work to do in our communities to try to make sure that not just community hospitals, but public health systems are prepared for the next pandemic. <laughs>